I'm delighted to welcome you into the second to the last speaker in our lecture series for International Development Studies this fall. Um, in case you didn't realize, this is actually the first term we're able to offer a lecture series or indeed any class specifically in the International Development Studies program because we recently got our rubric. So we're excited to be able to field this course. And I'm also really delighted to introduce my friend Peter McDonough who's um, going to be speaking tonight. He, I can give you just a little bit of background. Uh, he used to be a student at Stanford University in engineering. He was a teacher in the Peace Corps in Tanzania, and he actually used to be the Peace Corps recruiter here on campus, um, not this current year, but previous, previously. And I know him also because he's in the Columbia Regional Pipe Band as a drummer with my nephew, who's also a drummer in that pipe band. And you also went with them to Scotland, right? Yeah, so, OK, good. And right now, he's an instructor in the Environmental Studies program here on campus. And so with that, I'll turn it over to Peter. But let me just ask you, is it all right if we have a question if we raise our hand and interrupt you? Um, if it's like really a burning question, yeah. OK, oh. burning oh. questions. And then will we have some time at the end? Yes. To, OK, so burning questions during, during the talk. Otherwise, save them till the end. So thank you. With that, I'll turn it over to Peter. Okay. Thank you very much. How are you guys? We are good. How are you guys way in the back? This is the most dispersed classroom I know. I've seen in a long time. Um, so like she said, I'm covered in a microphone cord. My name is Peter. I um, was in the Peace Corps in Tanzania. And I, I know you had Terry here, mm -hmm. Terry Nichols, who's the current Peace Corps rep, talking about, I think, Zambia. And then you had Amber Gladney, who was two Peace Corps reps before her, yeah. talking about Mali. And then I was the Peace Corps rep between them, so last year. So some of you may have had me in a class at some point yakking on about Peace Corps. So the, um, the talk I'm going to give tonight, I'll touch on Peace Corps, but I think you've gotten quite a bit of the Peace Corps shtick kind of going on. I mean, she's a Peace Corps volunteer. Uh, four of your speakers or more have been Peace Corps volunteers. So I'm not going to talk too much about the Peace Corps. If you have questions, I'm happy to answer them. But I'm going to kind of focus more on sort of lessons learned, if that makes sense. You know, coming out of the Peace Corps, what was a new perspective for me. And it's not very academic. So it's not going to be highfalutin, not a lot of numbers, not a lot of academic research went into this. It's mostly experiential based. And so you will disagree with me on a lot of things tonight, and that's good, and I encourage that, because that's the whole point. The whole point of tonight is to challenge some of the things we tend to think about international mm -hmm. development. So without further ado, I'm going to stop talking and force you to do something. So if I could have half of you right over here. You can go back to your distant seats in the end, but half of you want to come down here, half of you want to kind of congregate over here. Now move closer. Move closer. So I have two pieces of paper. Each one has a question on it. It's two different questions. Don't share your questions with each other. Just discuss these as yourselves. Um, it's not a competition. I mean, you can try to win, but it's not a competition. So just discuss this with your group. I'll give you maybe three, four minutes. And answer the question just off the top of your head. Don't think very deeply about it. Just go with the first thoughts that come to you. So, so the question this group had, and we'll get to you guys later. Okay. Don't reveal what, what yours was, unless they already know. Um, thoughts about Africa. When someone says Africa, what's the first thing to jump to your mind? Nelson Mandela. Nelson Mandela, great. What else? Sahara Desert. Okay, opposite sides of the gun. This is good. What up? You guys can answer too. I say Africa. What what's Poverty. the image that jumps to your mind? Poverty. Poverty, okay. <laughs> ivory trade. Ivory trade? So Nelson Mandela and the ivory trade and the in the Sahara. And the 
Okay, Egypt. Tribes, animals. Tribes, uh, the same thing? No. Okay. Different. Tribes and then animals. Yeah, I'm listening. Okay. <laughs> Lion King. The Lion King, all right. Good. Nelson Mandela wasn't in that one, I don't think. No. no. <laughs> what else? Two more. You guys are quiet over here. I wish you thought eating caterpillars. Eating caterpillars? Yeah, because yeah. you watched the same thing. Yeah, so. yeah, I've eaten caterpillars. <laughs> they just taste like yeah, carbon. Mm -hmm. What else? One more. Blood Rich diamonds. in resources. Rich in resources and? Blood diamonds. Blood diamonds, okay. Anyone noticing a the theme? Is there a theme? Resources. Resources. And resources and animals. Okay, so kind of natural resources, more basic resources. Um, someone said the Sahara, yeah, you know, so scenic. Sand. 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 The theme is sand. You figured out the theme of my talk. Yeah, good. Um, that was just for fun. There was no right or wrong answer. I was just curious, you know, what what your exposure to Africa has been. Um, and I ask that of every group I talk to, and every group has had a different exposure. When I talk to seven-year-old Girl Scouts, they've had one set of experiences. You guys <laughs> have probably had a very different set of experiences. But in general, what um, Americans are exposed to in terms of Africa is through pop culture, or movies, or TV. Um, it's the Lion King. Who said the Lion King? Nice. <laughs> Get out of it. OK. So you know Swahili, Hakuna Matata. Yeah, good. <laughs> um, so The Lion King, obviously a big one, uh, took place in Tanzania or Kenya, depending on who you ask. Uh, the Last King of Scotland, has anyone seen this? Got a nod. Even if you had seen it, you probably wouldn't want to talk about it. It's, Is it really bloody? It's really bloody. Yeah. It's really good. It's about Idi Amin, the, the pretty evil dictator of Uganda. Um, Beasts of No Nation, anyone seen that? Really popular TV show, it's won a ton of awards. It's about child soldiers. Mm -hmm. So child soldiers, evil dictators, mm -hmm. uh, Elton John. Yeah, Elton. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, so this, is, you know, this makes up a big part of what we hear about Africa, what we see about it. Um, the other part tends to be contained in, in three things. The first would be crisis, mm -hmm. you know, war conflict of some kind. If you've seen Black Hawk Down, uh, Last King of Scotland, anything about Coney 2012. Anyone remember Coney 2012? That happened a month after I got home from Tanzania. I came home. Was in Tanzania? Like, no, he's in uh, Uganda, uh, Kenya area, Lake, Lake Victoria area. Um, notice he's pictured next to Osama bin Laden. And is that Hitler or Stalin? Yeah. That's Hitler, cheekbones. Um, so this was a, a big campaign to try to stop um, a warlord who was gathering child soldiers and creating a lot of the conflict in the area. Uh, we hear about AIDS. You know, for me, my age group growing up, it was all through the 90s and 2000s, Africa and AIDS were synonymous. If you talked about AIDS, you're talking about Africa. If you talk about Africa, you're talking about AIDS. Um, and then development, projects, NGOs, USAID, you know, Americans going abroad or Europeans going abroad and working on schools or water projects or electricity projects or food access or education or whatever it is. Peace Corps would fit in there. Um, so that's, that's kind of our image. Of, that's the typical American's image of Africa is a place of crisis, a place of need. Is that fairly accurate? Does that jive with everybody? Okay. Um, and this, I could illustrate this easily. I could pick any one picture of any one of my students and tell their story, and it would totally fit in to your image, our image of rural sub-Saharan Africa. So this is Miriam. She was a freshman in high school when I uh, started teaching. She was <coughs> about to start her senior year when I left. Only child of a single mother. Both of her parents had HIV. Dad had already died. Um, lived in really like your quintessential mud hut with the thatch roof. Like whatever you're picturing in your mind, that's what they lived in. So like off the road, off the goat path, through a wheat field, was this tiny little hut with a thatch roof, and that's all they had. They were subsistence farmers. And so she was so poor 
that in a village of very poor people, uh, her school fees were never followed up on. If she didn't pay, the school didn't ask questions. Uh, other kids would be chased away from school until they paid, things like that. But that's, that was her life. There was no chance that she was going to go on after secondary school. Um, it was barely feasible that she could pay for secondary school. And she lives in a very tiny village uh, that has an almost 45% HIV rate. And that's her story. It's a very easy story to tell. It, it fits in with what we think about. So the question um, to us today is, what's the core problem? What's going on? What is, what's driving this? What, what's perpetuating it? And what's the solution? So that's what we're going to tackle today. And I'm going to give you a taste of it, of what Peace Corps volunteers learn before we go over. So I'm going to mute this real fast. I'm going to force you to do one more thing for me. We'll play a little game that Peace Corps makes us play when we do staging. So staging for Peace Corps is the two days in America when you meet up with your cohort before they send you abroad for training. So you meet in a hotel somewhere in Philadelphia and you do getting to know you games and you talk about Tanzania and stuff like that. So we're going to play that game. So I need half of you to stay in here and half of you to meet me outside the doors. So let's say you guys meet me outside, you guys stay here. I don't even know what that is. <laughs> it was the staging game that we played. <laughs> we should play your game next. Okay, yeah. um, <coughs> so you guys are going to be, um, we'll just call you a native community. You're, you're a community that they are coming to visit. They are anthropologists, okay. social scientists. Okay. They're going to come visit you. Okay. And their goal is to figure out what your problem is. You have a problem. And it's their goal to figure out what it is. Do we each it. have a separate problem or just one big problem? You have the same problem. Okay. But your problem is very simple and they don't know this. Are we just going to stay sitting here? No, you can get up, move around. Uh, actually, when they come in, it'd be great if you guys are spread out a little bit so they could spread out. Uh, it's very simple. They can only ask you yes or no questions and you can only answer yes or no. You answer yes if they're smiling when they ask you. You answer no if they're not smiling. When so we don't listen to their question, we just look at their facial expressions. Yeah, I appear to be listening. Be polite. Um, you know, you don't want people to lose face. Um, so no if they're not smiling. Yes if they are smiling. If you don't know if they're smiling or they keep changing it, uh, you can say maybe or I don't know, depending on the context. Okay? And okay. don't give it away. Oh, what's our problem? That is the problem. Uh -huh. They don't know. There is no problem. Okay. okay. Yeah, spread out. So you are a team of anthropologists or aid workers or whoever you want to identify with. And you're visiting a local community. And you can put that community wherever you want. But they, you've been told, you've heard that there's a specific problem in this community and they need someone to figure it out and help them find a solution. So. Your goal is to figure out what the problem is and then try to solve it. You can only ask yes or no questions. And they can only answer yes or no or maybe, depending on the question. Okay. Could be hard. <laughs> Could be hard. I mean, if you ever played 20 questions, you can narrow things down to figure it out. So I've, I change the problem every time I play this game. So they have a new one for you. So I'll give you about, say, five, 10 minutes to try to figure it out. Okay, and they've spread out, so you guys can spread out, or you can gang up on one person and <laughs> do what you got to do. Are you sick? No. Oh. Are you hungry? No. Yeah, you can come on. Are you cold? Um. Yes. Do you live in a house? Uh, are yes. you? Do you have heat? No. Mm. Do you have water? Um, no. What's that? <laughs> Are you alone? No. Do you know? Do you have family? 
There's five of you, there's other people you can ask. It's just say. Who are you saying? Because you're doing so bad. I'll ask. Who's everybody going? Do you have clothes? Yes. Yes. Well, yes. they're cold and they don't have water. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Are you underway? <laughs> yes. Uh. So. What? What do you guys? Uh. What do you got so far? I got. They're she doesn't cold. know how to. She doesn't know how to guard it. Not for it to be. They're cold. <laughs> they have a house. But they don't have weight. Okay, so. Mm -hmm. Well. Do you, do you have you animals? Like, no. Uh, no uh, do you live in a place <laughs> where there could be? No. Do you live in a place where there could be like gardening? <laughs> yes. Um, do you have anything good? Do you live in Africa? Yes. Um, Did you go to school or have any education? No. Okay. Did any of your family? No. Does anyone? Okay. Yes. Does your family make money? Okay. You have to ask your family. Does the family make little money? Oh, she does. Yeah. Yeah. Not so not like farmers? Doesn't know how to guard it. Oh, yeah, you don't have animals, right? It's your question. Yes, sir. Right, should we make an outcome? Yeah, we'll go to the leaders. Is there, <laughs> is there, are there, are there, there uh, maybe there's a, uh, uh, um, food, plant, uh, disease, maybe, <laughs> <laughs> Keep going. You can return to whatever seat you Great. had preferred. <laughs> it's nice with everybody down here, though. Just, just say it. Yeah. Just say it. You know, put that up. Thank you. You did take a shower. I didn't, actually. That's uh, <laughs> peaceful. Yeah, we get the full experience. <laughs> People have actively left this part of the room. Um, so those of you who are on team anthropologist aid worker, does anyone want to take a stab at what I think the answer was? One person. Um, there are resources. 
Well, and resources. So can a representative from the local community confirm yes or no whether that's true? Maybe. Uh, well, say, what, what are the resources in the local population? Maybe. I mean, based on the rules I gave you. Is that the answer? Maybe. maybe. If it's supposed to be yes or no, you can't say maybe. <laughs> yeah, I can. So ignore the, the rules of the game. Oh, okay. Is this the problem that I gave you? No. No. Um, okay. So you guys didn't get it. Question? She told me she was a prostitute. Oh, well, that's, that's fine. <laughs> to each their own. <laughs> <laughs> it's not something I needed to know. <laughs> the things you discover in the aid business. Um, okay, so we'll come back to the answer towards the end. So those of you who were playing the role, hold that deep, hold it tight for now. Just don't be constipated. Um, so we'll come back to it. So you can just file it away for now. Uh, it'll make sense. So based on this difficulty, and you had asked, is this to illustrate a language barrier? And certainly that, that can be part of it. Language barrier is a big thing. Um, but we had this, this bigger question of like, what, what is the core problem? <laughs> what is the root problem of this sort of underdevelopment um, or lack of development? And um, what's wrong with our approach? Why haven't we been able to fix this yet? We as a global community. Um, so if we think about it, it, it makes sense. Our approach so far kind of makes sense, right? We, um, if we just think about it in terms of the West or the United States, and let's just use Africa as a proxy for now, because that's it's an easier one to identify. The West has gained so much from the African continent and the African people. Um, and it's sort of our responsibility, maybe our moral, to return some of that, right? To give aid, to give assistance. You know, we took human resources, financial resources, natural resources, land, um, and we developed very quickly because of it. So it's kind of on us to give some of that back, give back our time, our energy, our resources, technology, things like that. Does that kind of easily explain the aid ethic, like why we're doing this? So if it makes sense to give, um, and it's, it's a very obvious, like we took and now we're giving back, why isn't it working? So that's where we're going to start now. So there are a few, I need this thing back. There are a few kind of um, simple answers that come up. You know, if I ask someone just around the United States, why isn't our aid project working? Uh, they have a few different answers for us. First might be, oh, sorry. Oh, this is to refer to colonization, which we just sort of talked about. Um, is it corruption? You know, we give a lot of aid, we give a lot of resources, we send people. Is it the fact that the countries themselves are so corrupt that we can't get anything done? Certainly that's part of it, but corruption is not a one-way street. Um, corruption doesn't exist in a vacuum. You know, you have to create it somehhow. So this is from Dan Samoyo, who wrote the book Dead Aid, who one of your early speakers recommended you not read and I'm recommending you do read, but read it with a grain of salt. Um, Danby Samoyo is an economist for the World Bank, but she's born and raised in um, Zambia. So she is Zambian. And she says, a constant stream of free <coughs> money is a perfect way to keep an inefficient or simply bad government in power. Yeah, this is something we can see very easily. Um, under the all-encompassing aid system, too many places in Africa continue to flounder under inept, corrupt, and despotic regimes who spend their time courting and catering to the demands of the army of aid organizations. I love that imagery of the army of aid organizations. And if you go there, it really does feel like an army sometimes. There are fleets of land cruisers, white land cruisers with NGO logos on the driver doors. Um, it really does feel that way sometimes. Um, but as per the, for the first quote, you could throw a dartboard. You could throw a dart. Don't throw a dartboard. Throw a dart at a dart, at a map of the world, and you could hit a country that has received aid and has driven corruption in the upper ranks of its government. 
you know, they're, it's not a rarity. A perfect example, anyone know who this guy is in the lower right? I'll give you a hint, we have refugees from his country who are living here now, Congo. This is President Mobutu, um, who was the president of Congo from its independence, shortly after its independence, about a year after its independence, up until the early 90s. He was propped up by the American government because he was a capitalist and pro-democracy. Um, and so he served as a really good proxy against the Soviet Union. And if you think back to the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, this was a time when the United States and the Soviet Union were constantly vying for influence in pretty much every country in the world. And every country was a little political proxy war against the Soviet Union. Um, so Mobutu, being pro-capitalist, was America's go-to guy to have in the Congo. So they propped him up. He ended up being a completely despotic dictator, uh, killed and stole for about 30 years. 40 years? 30 years. He was there for a long time. As soon as the Soviet Union fell, as soon as it collapsed in 1992, the United States pulled its support from Mobutu, and he was gone within a year. A military coup rose up. Like, if that's not a really clear illustration of how corruption is driven by aid, by foreign development, uh, this is a good one. Um, and he's not, he's not the only one. Mugabe is another one. Uh, over half of the countries in South and Central America have gone through this sort of thing. An American-supported um, ruler falling when America pulls its support. Yeah, mega list. Um, so corruption is a factor. It does make international development hard to do. But again, it doesn't exist in a vacuum. It's a two-way street. So if you want to undo corruption, you also have to hold up a mirror to foreign aid and take a look at it. Um, another question is, are we not doing enough? And I'm sorry, this is supposed to be a sequential slide, so the map is kind of covering the graph. <coughs> but if you look at just the graph, that blue line is the amount of foreign aid given by the world to other countries in the world um, from about 1960 until 2010, every year. So it started at about $40 billion a year and has reached, what, 130? It's probably way above that by now. So that's the total amount of money we as a global community spend on foreign aid. Per year. Per year. Um, the red line on the bottom is just the portion of that that goes to Sub-Saharan Africa. So it's still in the tens of billions, dozens of billions. So is that, does that seem like enough money to you? Like, in your opinion, is this too much? Should we, is it not enough? Should we be increasing it? It's not enough because of the huge population growth in that time period, so. Okay, yeah, so population has done this. <laughs> it's, it's doubled since 1960, yeah. I think it depends on where the money is being spent. Like, a lot of the time, it can be towards like military ventures, although it's given in the name of development projects. It can go into things that probably aren't you know, ethically considered development. So you're giving the correct answer, which is it depends. Yeah. Yeah, you can't just say globally, we need more money or we need less money. It really does depend where it's going. But does it seem like a lot of money? $130 billion a year? Yeah. No. no? To give you a, a point of reference, the Global Climate Fund agreed on at the Paris negotiations last year was that we would give $100 billion a year for climate mitigation and adaptation in the most at-risk countries. And we haven't even gotten close to meeting that $100 billion goal. I think the US offered $8 billion or less. Two billion? So we weren't even willing to give that for climate adaptation and mitigation. Um, so the fact that we spend upwards of 130 billion a year on foreign aid, it's a lot of money. I mean, you could say it's not enough. And it's certainly not a lot compared to what we spend on the military. But it is a boatload of money. So. 
but this and there's there's correlation. The more money we spend on aid, a lot of uh, um, human development index metrics do better. The Millennium Development Goal metrics do a little bit better. It does correlate, but it's not quite living up to that promise of the 1960s, 1970s, when every American president was saying, "This decade, we're going to solve world hunger. This decade, we're going to end poverty. This decade, we're going to cure AIDS." Uh, it's never even come close to living up to that promise. So despite this massive amount of money, um, this is what the Human Development Index map still looks like. It's still dark red all through Sub-Saharan Africa. Okay, except for South Africa and Botswana. Another common response you could give to this is maybe we're not using the right tech. You know, is the technology we're trying to apply to these problems just inappropriate? And there's whole kinds of discussions you could have on this. You could write eight PhD dissertations about the appropriateness of technology in foreign development. Um, the top left, you've already seen this picture, water pumps. You know, getting clean water to people is one of the most basic things you can do. It's item, it's in the top three of the Millennium Development Goals is clean water. Um, and a pump seems pretty reasonable. You know, it's mechanically operated. There's no petrol or electricity needed. Kids can use it, adults can use it. Uh, it's designed to fit right in those buckets that are ubiquitous in Sub-Saharan Africa. Seems like appropriate tech. Uh, a solar panel. There is no more appropriate way to get electricity in Africa. There's just a lot of some. Um, efficient cook stoves, this is one of my favorites. Just about every like, design lab at every university in the country has come out with some efficient cook stove. And there are thousands of NGOs out of Europe, the US, Australia, focusing on efficient cook stoves. Why is that a big focus? Like, what's the big deal about efficient cook stoves? Well, fuel is short, and also some cook stoves have a lot of smoke, so it can cause a lot of lung problems. So it's health, respiratory health, eye health, cancer. Yeah, so basic human health, especially for women and children. Um, what was the first thing you said? Fuel is fuel. short. Yeah, so dealing with deforestation, one of the best things you can do is just to make a, a more efficient stove. What else? Who typically does all the cooking and wood harvesting? Women. Women. And? Kids. Girls, yeah. <laughs> Kids, mostly girls. So if they're harvesting wood, they can't go to school. So if you're trying to empower women and the girls can't even go to school, how much luck are you going to have? So efficient cook stoves are considered sort of like the silver bullet to so many of the problems, or at least a really good starting point. Um, but the ironic thing is that so few of these have ever taken off. There must be thousands of designs out there, designed by really brilliant engineers who are really thinking hard about appropriate technology, local materials, local resources, local artisans. Um, but it very rarely takes off at all. These designs just end up in the trash. And I can't tell you how many times, I can tell you how many times, seven out of ten times, let's say, uh, when it comes up in conversation that I was working in Tanzania, people say, oh yeah, my friend has a, is part of an efficient cook stove NGO there. Or my aunt uh, does water projects there. She goes there once a month every year, or once one month every year. <coughs> um, or I just donated to a solar company that's doing this. Like this is, this is everywhere. This appropriate technology thing has become a theme in international development. So could we do better? Probably. But inappropriate tech is probably not the single reason that development efforts are not living up to their promise. So there's got to be something more. Is it the way we do it? Is it the way we're set up? Um, so this, everyone remember? Who was here week three when Regan talked about USAID? Yeah, a lot of metrics on the board. Um, I'll, I'll simplify it all. Um, so USAID, everyone knows USAID? It's the big federal um, agency, essentially. Yeah, agency, thank you. 
uh, that funnels money from taxpayers to international development efforts. Massive, massive budget. Again, in the tens of billions of dollars, if not more. And what they do is they just put out calls for proposals and they funnel that money into NGOs, missions, charities, uh, not-for-profits, things like that. Anyone who has a project needs the money and is willing to go and do it. That's pretty much all they do. Along with these, there are things called the briefcase NGOs. Has anyone heard of these? These are NGOs that um, anytime there's a call for proposals, when there's funding available, they'll just write a proposal for whatever it is, collect the funding, go set up a facade of a project, and live the American dream in a foreign country for three years. And then when the funding dries up, they go get more. You know, they, maybe they snap a few pictures of African orphans while they're there, then they go get more funding, then they go do it somewhere else. These are called briefcase NGOs. Um, they're not everywhere, but there are a lot of them. Um, another term you might hear is the Beltway Bandits. Has anyone heard of this? These are contractors that just kind of hover around Washington, D.C. And as soon as calls for proposals go out, they just snap them right up. And they make their entire living off of USAID funding. And they do projects. You know, they're a little bit better than the briefcase NGOs, but they're called the Beltway Bandits because this is how they live. So there are entire subsets of this population, our population, that survives on our money for foreign development. But the way it was presented to you, I think in week three, um, is kind of as a one-way funnel. Money from USAID gets funneled into projects. And it doesn't quite work that way. I think someone asked that day, what's the reason? Why does the US spend so much money on international development? Like, what do we get out of it? And I think his answer was, we don't get anything out of it. It's just because it's a good thing to do. Uh, we get a lot out of it. We get a ton out of it. I was thinking about food aid, where it, like, it has to come from the US and be transported on US ships. And so most of the money just goes to US money. Yes, 70%. 70%. 70%, yeah. This is, the, this is the golden 70%. It might even be higher by now. This, the United States requires, of all funding going abroad, 70% be recirculated back into the United States economy. Think about that. 70%. The next highest country on this list is Canada at 33%. <coughs> 33. We more than double the next country's requirement. And Canada, you can consider stingy. So this means, as Teresa was just saying, it's if you want to go abroad, you have to travel on an American airline or on an airline that's an American cardholder. So for example, if I want to get to Tanzania, I can't fly British Airways. I can't fly Air France. I can't fly Ethiopian Air. I can't fly Air Emirates. I have to fly KLM because KLM is a cardholder with Delta Airlines. And I have to do that. If I live in the country and I want appliances for my house, I have to import them from the United States in their big shipping containers. If you work for the embassy, you will live in a <coughs> giant house full of American appliances. 70%. This also means home offices. If you are going to spend, let's say, 100 million in a year, you might spend 20 million of that on a home office, someone sitting by a phone, raising money here in the States, making a lot of money. Uh, and then the, some of it goes to staff in the country, and then maybe like 10% actually goes to the project and to the people that you're supposed to be helping. Every NGO is different. They have ratios, they have metrics to show how much of your money is actually being spent on the project. Um, but it's not 100% ever, really. So that's the 70%. Um, the other thing is conditionalities. Has everyone heard this term before, conditionalities? The money is conditional. Uh, if I give you funding, you have to do things that I want you to do. Otherwise, I'm not giving you funding. I'm giving him funding. Um, so imagine I came to you and said, here's 100 billion. Do you want 100 billion? OK, will you agree to a few things? OK, first, um, what do you study? 
Creative. Okay, you're fine. Um, creative writing, it's not a big money maker. It's not going to be sustainable. So I'd like you to change your major. Could you do business for me? No. <laughs> okay. I'm not. Are you willing to do business? Yeah. Okay, you get the money. So you're going to change your major to business. All right. Um, also, some of your friends are nice. The rest, they're probably not so good for you. So if I'm just going to give you a list. If you could just hang out with these people more, that'd be great. Is that all right? Yeah. Okay, good. Also, the hair. It's just not, not appropriate. And if you could also adopt all of my political leanings and uh, moral opinions. Is that good? No? All right, I'm going to give the money to her. This is condition out. This is how it works. Basically, the US government um, is saying, you are in need of aid. But part of the problem that this aid is trying to address is that your government structure or your policies um, or your level of transparency is not enough for this aid to be effective. In order for this money to be effective, you need to pass these laws. You need to prioritize these things. And that's conditionality. What this has turned into in some cases is that foreign governments are basically writing all the laws of the recipient governments. So do with that what you please. So in answer to the question, is this part of the problem? Possibly. The way we have it set up could contribute. Keep in mind that Peace Corps is not exempt from this. And I'm a Peace Corps representative. I love the Peace Corps. I would not trade my service for anything. And I would encourage you to look into it if you're interested in international work. But the Peace Corps by itself was not started as just this benevolent, we're going to just go help people and spend a lot of money on it sort of thing. It was started in 1961. What was going on in 1961? Cold War, yeah. It's a giant picture of it right there. Again, we were, we were in conflict with the Soviet Union with all these proxy wars. We were trying to gain influence over every country that we could that was gaining independence from its <coughs> um, imperial overlords, British, French. And we would give aid. We would have alliances. We would send military support. We would make trade deals with them in order to get them to stay capitalist and to have a friendly relationship with the United States. Peace Corps was just another one of these strategies. It worked. It was really good. The basic premise was instead of working with the government on relations, let's have really good relationships with like people to people, just person to person. Doesn't need to be diplomat to diplomat. Uh, and it ended up working pretty well to the point that it's still going despite the lack of Soviet Union. But everything, everything we do in international development um, has multiple layers to it. It's not just uh, we have solutions. We're going to go do good. Here's a bunch of stuff. Okay, bye. It's, there's more layers to it. Oh, I don't have a slide. So just to recap, um, kind of the two ethics of development are, you could say the general ethic, the kind of layman ethic, our ethic is that we have been very fortunate, partially at the expense of developing countries. Um, they have been very unfortunate. And it is our duty or responsibility or our burden to help. Kind of just basic ethic there. The government ethic is very similar, but it includes this idea that the reason you're not developing very quickly is that your government is not mature enough to do it. And so we're going to give you some pointers, a few requirements, uh, to help you move along. So if you're going to accept, <coughs> do you guys accept that kind of premise of that's, that's kind of how we think about it? All right, so if we're going to accept that, and I accept that too, uh, we have to acknowledge something very important. We have to acknowledge that this ethic is based on a story that we tell ourselves about why things came to be the way they are. I'm going to tell you that story uh, in four chapters. Chapter one, the story. They have a problem. 
because we haven't applied the right solution. The implication is that we haven't yet applied the right solution. We have a solution because we already overcame that problem. Hunger, disease, standard of living, water and food security, political security, political stability. These are all problems that we, have the United, we as the United States <laughs> or the West have overcome in some way. Problems that the third world now faces. We overcame that problem through our ingenuity. This is part of the story. We overcame disease through science and technology. We had people like Henry Ford. We had John D. Rockefeller. We had Nikola Tesla. We had Albert Einstein. Through creativity, through hard work, through ingenuity, we overcame the problems that we were coming up against and that, again, the third world is now facing. And lastly, applying our ingenuity on behalf of the less fortunate will allow them to thrive. That's the basic story. That's the story we have to be telling ourselves in order to think about those two things I just mentioned. That it's our responsibility or our duty to help those less fortunate and that we have the solution to apply. It's a terrible book. <laughs> Don't read that story. Did this kind of, what? Kids are so happy. I know, right? All these, I love this one especially. I love this picture. This is so good. I wish political campaigns still had stuff like this. So if we're accepting the premise of our development ethic, and we are accepting this story as what we probably tell ourselves, then the last thing we have to acknowledge is that this is inherently patriarchal. It's paternalistic, maternalistic, however you want to say it. It is top down. It is, we have a solution, they have a problem, we can fix them. Now, I warned you, you would disagree with me on a lot of things in this presentation, and you're welcome to disagree with this. Um, this is part of the process. So if we're going to accept that, then this is the premise we need to start with now. I keep starting you with different premises. We're finding new starting points. So this is now our starting point again. One, the Global Development Project has not delivered on the promise that it gave us. And that's not really a matter of opinion. It's just some things were stated. We never really got to those goals. Um, again, Regan talked about that especially the Millennium Development Goals. Uh, and two, patriarchy is a characteristic of the development ethic. It doesn't mean that you are evil. It doesn't mean that you are not kind or caring or benevolent um, by engaging in this. It just means that patriarchy is an inherent characteristic of the system that we have designed around giving foreign aid. Expressions are becoming more dour just droopy. Don't worry, they'll get more so. Okay, so that's our premise right now. So now the question is, how did we get to that point? How did this become? And how is it perpetrated now? Not perpetrated, perpetuated? Continued? Um, and anyone who passed third grade could, could answer this. <laughs> it's, it's historical. You know, you start right around the time of colonialism and go forward. And the natural outcome is a sense of imbalance, a sense of power and powerless. Um, I wouldn't go all the way back to the time of the caravel. You know, when we first started, when Europeans first started trading with Africa, then they were pretty much on equal footing. Um, there were African empires that rivaled the European empires in size and population and technology. Um, before colonization, 
Africans living around Lake Victoria were the first to invent steel before even the Europeans did. So they were actually on equal footings for a lot of history. Right around the time of the invention of the caravel, Europeans were able to finally travel down the coast. Uh, and that was a fairly equal relationship. And it kind of separated from that. So classic examples you can see in art. Anyone know who this is? It says on the bottom. But yeah, sorry. Rhodes, anyone heard of the Rhodes Scholarship? Okay, so Cecil Rhodes was uh, a great kind of, I don't know how you describe him, like a, he was a renaissance man of his time. He was a builder, he was an inventor, he was a statesman, um, he was an explorer, and his dream was to conquer Africa. And he was going to conquer Africa by building a road and then a railroad from Cairo in Egypt to Cape Town in South Africa, hence where his boots are. He's holding up the railroad. This is a classic drawing. Um, and he did, he conquered it, he built the road. I don't know if he finished the railroad. I don't think he did. But he built the road. In fact, I lived very close to the road in Tanzania. It's still in use. You can drive from Cairo to Cape Town. And there's a bunch of Australians that bike it every year. They're a funny bunch. Especially when you get in dan drunk in dance competitions with them. That's kind of a weird thing. <laughs> anyway, um, Peace Corps, hey. Uh, another classic drawing. Does anyone know this one on the right, lower right? That's got to be Manifest Destiny. Manifest Destiny. I couldn't think of it. I called it Westward Ho. Yeah. <laughs> That's the subtitle. Um, anyone know th what, what's her name? <laughs> what is it? Yeah, it's just the toga thing that she's got going on. She's got a different name. They're related. I think they're cousins on her mother's side. I don't know. We named the space shuttle after her. She's named after the explorer that discovered the Americas. Endeavor? <laughs> no. What's the other one? It exploded. The last one to explode. Oh, come on. I don't know. For Columbia? Yes. Yeah. Columbia. Her name is Columbia. She is the personification. She is the symbol of manifest destiny in the United States, but just kind of progress anywhere else. She symbolizes the burden, the duty, the responsibility, the power of the white man to tame the wilderness to chase away evil, in this case, Native Americans, and bison, and for some reason, a black bear, those evil bison. Um, that's the symbol for Americans, not Americans, white people taming wildness. White people taming wildness. And when you have this, such an obvious imbalance, white settlers versus Native Americans, European settlers versus Africans, where one is so clearly powerful compared to the other one, you're naturally going to have a perspective, a perception that one must be inherently better than the other one. If it just goes on all the time, whites must assume that they are better than the African or better than the Native American. Um, that's why Jared Diamond had to write Guns, Germs, and Steel to kind of like roll back this idea that white people are dominate the earth because they are inherently better at something. That there's a much more simple and interesting geographical, historical explanation for why things became so imbalanced. But it did create this idea, better, worse. It has to. And this shows up not just in the art, but in the literature. Anyone know Rudyard Kipling? <coughs> What did he write? Big famous book? Jungle. Jungle Book. I was going to ask for Disney references. But. Take up the white man's burden. To wait in heavy harness, unfluttered folk and wild, your new caught sullen people, half devil and half child. Be by open speech and simple, a hundred times made plain. So I've just taken excerpts from this. The white man's burden, that's pretty an obvious one white man's responsibility to civilize the world. To wait in heavy harness on fluttered folk and wild, to suffer them patiently is what that means. To be patient with the burden 
of having to civilize these wild people. Your new caught sullen people, half devil and half child. The child theme is going to keep coming back. You know, the paternal, patriarchal view, seeing them as a child. By open speech and simple, a hundred times made plain. They're too simple-minded to understand you the first 99 times. So talk slowly and plainly. And this is what we are told when we travel abroad, anywhere. Talk slowly and plainly. Don't learn their language. Just speak English louder and slower. <laughs> You've all seen it. We all do it. Um, so that's Kipling. Um, but keep in mind, he was writing for his time. This was the late 1800s, the height of the colonial period, the height of the British Empire. This was the ethic of the day. In fact, you might consider him progressive in some ways because he calls it a burden. He calls it a responsibility rather than just they're stupid so let's kill them all, which was also a popular ethic of the day. So put it in context. Um, but this also um, I mean, this, this, we, this you would call blatantly racist. There, it's really easy to find the blatantly racist stuff. Um, this is a quote from this month. To be white is to be a striver, a crusader, an explorer, and a conqueror. We build, we produce, and we go upward. We don't exploit other groups. We don't gain anything from their presence. They need us and not the other way around. This is this month. I was really hoping I could like do these sequentially because I was holding his name off and I was going to ask you when you thought this was from because it's so reminiscent of Mein Kampf. Question? Richard Spencer, he's one of the higher ups in the National Policy Institute, which is an alt-right group. He's from Whitefish. They had a convention in DC a couple days after the election. So it's very timely. But you can see the similarities, Kipling to Spencer. Granted, Kipling was common in his time, Spencer's uncommon now. <coughs> the fact that I'm sitting in a room full of white people who don't think this way shows that a lot has changed. But it's still there. We still have it. Um, another one, I didn't put this on a slide. This is a, a woman talking about uh, recently settled refugees from the Congo. They do not know how to use modern appliances and often trash them in the process of learning how to operate dishwashers, stoves, etc. Seems like a mundane comment when you realize what she's saying is they're children. Not only can they not operate these, because they've probably never seen them before, but it's not even worth trying to explain it. It's not even worth trying to teach them. They won't understand. She's from Missoula. And she was referring specifically to the Congolese refugees that settled here in August and September, uh, and who I work with as my other job when I'm not giving presentations, because they speak Swahili. So there's this theme, Kipling to Missoula lady, whose name I won't give out, um, top down, parent, child, white, not. This is the easy stuff. You can just Google racist quote, and you will get all of these. Really, you should do it when you go home. <coughs> um, the harder part is the more subtle language that exists throughout all of our development documents and our rhetoric. Um, that seed still exists in what we say. We aren't all white supremacists. We aren't all racists. But that seed is still there. Um, uncivilized in Kipling's time became underdeveloped. Savage people in Kipling's time became the third world. Third world has other meanings. It's also just sort of like the third option, not capitalism or socialism. <coughs> but it's still, we use it to basically mean savage people. Um, you, could, you could toss any other word in here that you've probably seen all over the place. And we use these, OK. We use these all the time. He's never going to know the answer to that game. Oh, that's sad. Um, 
you know, how many of you have used the term underdeveloped or third world when talking about any development? Yeah, I do it all the time. It's in my thesis, for God's sakes. Oh, no, you didn't take the class from me. stopped you. Well, it's in my thesis because I'm making this complaint in my thesis. Uh -oh. So, yeah, sorry. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so these are the ones, because we use them all the time, because they're ubiquitous. In Kipling's time, this was ubiquitous. This didn't feel racist. It's just how you describe people who aren't you. This is still how we describe people who aren't us. Um, but it gets even more insipid. Incipient? Insipid. Insipid. And it bleeds down into the people we're talking about. Tanzania itself referred to its own urbanization rate as lacking, which may seem like a silly comment to make, but it implies urban good, rural bad. Western lifestyle good. Rural African lifestyle, bad. That's their own comment about their own people. India refers to um, native, the indigenous peoples of India, and its lower castes as backward. In a document from 2014. These are both from 2014. So this isn't even white people saying you're backward, or white people saying you need more urbanization because rural life is silly. This is them adopting that ethic from people who told them that it's true and then applying it to the people below them. And you can see it on every level. When I was living in the village, um, people living in Dar es Salaam, the major city, referred to all the other cities in Tanzania as kind of bush. Like kind of, the term was polini, which means like out there. It's how you refer to wild animals, polini. Uh, and then people in those cities would refer to my junction town as kind of backward, backwater. And then that junction town referred to my village as backwater. And then my village referred to the next village over as backwater. Then that village had no one to refer to because they really were kind of at the end <laughs> of the highlands. Like there's literally no one beyond them. There was just wilderness beyond that. Um, so we just, we, we adopt these, this rhetoric, this language, these words. Um, I mean, you can't, I, I had friends in Tanzania and even in Nepal when I was working there who referred to themselves as backwards, who said, I'm a Tanzanian, I can't do that. I'm not smart enough to do that. I don't have uh, the brains to do that. You can't think that about yourself unless someone <laughs> has thought that to you or thought that at you. So this rhetoric that we've used up here is bleeding down. It's becoming common language for everybody now. Um, sorry. So just to, just kind of, I think you get the point, but that seed that, you know, fuels Kipling's comments, fuels Spencer's comments, the top-down seed, that still exists, even for those of us who don't consider ourselves white supremacists. It's still there. And that's not to say that these two are equal. You know, aid worker on the left, white supremacist on the right, not equal. Okay? I'm not saying that you, can, you would treat them the same or think of them the same, but that seed is still there. And I had a video I was going to show, but um, it, it was so racist that it's been taken off YouTube from five different channels, so I can't find it anymore. So sorry about that. But it's something that you can see even in the subtle even the little things that we think are okay in the development world. I had a friend in Tanzania named Sarah. Um, and she was doing her master's thesis. Her, the goal of her master's thesis was to find five NGOs in Tanzania that weren't effective and five NGOs that were effective. And she was going to try to understand what the differences were, what the basic premise was. She couldn't find one that was effective. They were all ineffective or just kind of neutral. Some were actively defective, harmful. And so what she ended up writing her thesis about was why that is. Why all these NGOs that claim to be on equal partnership to be <coughs> doing good work weren't actually making any difference. And what she found was that, you know, the, the development ethic of the, let's say, 1970s, 1980s was Americans with resources and solutions come in and they help 
the Africans understand what to do. And they kind of guide it and direct it. And then right around the 90s, this ethic started to switch and say, we need to, we need to reverse this. This can't be how it goes. Instead of this, we need equality. We need partnership. You know, you can't, you can't have this. It doesn't work. We need to be working hand in hand, making joint decisions. And what she found was that all the NGOs she studied claimed to be doing this. But when she interviewed them separately, the white and the African, the whites all said, this is great. We're so glad we switched to this model. We're equal. We're learning so much from them. We're getting so much more done. There's mutual respect. And when she interviewed the Tanzanians, they said, we're really polite to them, but they run this place. There is no equality here. It's perceived as equality to them because they see what they want to see. And because in Tanzanian culture, you don't insult someone to their face. And Americans don't know how to read that. So what they thought was this was actually this. Same thing. And the issue there that she found was that this is not the opposite of this. The opposite of this is this. On the microphone, this is going to make no sense. I'm so sorry. This, 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 and this. And this is where Peace Corps sits, actually. It's one of the few in the world that does it, which is why I still really like Peace Corps. Instead of coming in and saying, we'll help you find the solutions, we come in and say, you know what to do. Tell us how we can help. We work for you. So Peace Corps specifically comes in at the bottom rung. <coughs> like I was a, a high school math and science teacher. And I came in as the lowest teacher on the rung. Every other teacher in that school had authority over me. And that was great. Because I didn't have a clue what I was doing. I'm a white dude with a college degree, living in a country that I've never been to, speaking a language I've never heard of. Why would I be in charge? So that's where Peace Corps tends to sit. Um, you can find lots of other examples of kind of the proverbial ugly American. Anyone know that term, the ugly American? OK, read the book. It's a good book, The Ugly American. So about six minutes. Yeah, OK. Oh boy, this will be fun. So think back to the game that we played. Someone from the native community want to tell what the answer was? What was the problem? Do you want to? There was no problem. What was the rule I gave you? Um, if you guys asked a question and you were smiling, we said yes, and if you weren't, we said no. Uh, and if you were neutral, we could say maybe because we couldn't tell because you weren't frowning or smiling. <laughs> Stupid game, right? <laughs> so th there's several points to this game. The first is the language barrier idea that you don't necessarily understand. Even if you understand the words, you may not get the meaning. The second lesson that's more surface level is that you don't necessarily know what the problem is. You may think it's one thing, but it's probably not what you're thinking. It's probably not what you're looking for. But a much more fundamental lesson from this game should be that it's absolutely ridiculous that you would walk into a community and pretend that you can figure out their problem and solve it. You, an outsider who don't speak that language. It's silly that you would do that. I mean, imagine someone from Uganda coming to Missoula and say, wow, you guys have some problems. Here's how you can fix them. We'd be insulted. Like, what are you talking about? This is my town. <coughs> I know what I'm doing. Um, so you, those of you who um, were on the anthropologist aid worker side, is that you people? OK. Uh, don't worry. You weren't expected to find the answer. And it's not meant to make you feel bad. When I first played that game, I felt I was a sore loser. I was on your team. I never figured out what was going on. <laughs> and I was just like, I was like, oh, this is like, there's something, something I didn't get, or it's my fault, or I felt, I felt I was a sore loser um, until I figured out what the whole point of this was. So thank you for those of you who played and uh, held your own. And thank you guys for letting me push you through that meat grinder for five minutes. Um, OK. Very quickly, we'll skip over that. Just adding one conclusion, our own perspectives are subject to this ethic and contribute to it. This is a cycle. Every time we talk about this, we can perpetuate it or not. Um, and we'll go back to Africa. So you guys came up with this list of 
of things that you think about when I say Africa. So let's see what they were. Safari, hunger, AIDS, Nelson Mandela, African Americans, clicking, caterpillars, malaria, Egyptians, the Lion King, the Sahara, Cape Town, slave trade, elephants, again, pirates, and the ivory trade. Elephants made a strong showing here. That's good. Take, take these. Think of an American analogy to them and ask yourself if that's the perception you would want a Tanzanian to think of America. So instead of the Sahara, you might say, what type does it? Plains. It's not a desert. The Mojave. Yeah, the Mojave Desert. Yeah. Um, instead of saying African Americans, what, American Africans? I don't know. Instead of AIDS, we have AIDS. Instead of Cape Town, say New York City. So those of you who are on the American side, what, what were your things that you came up with that you would want? That you, when I say America, what, what comes to your mind? I want you to say it. Not, I'm not looking at the paper. Freedom. Freedom? The plague? The plague? <laughs> the, the flag. Okay. It's like the plague didn't. Wealth. Wealth. Uncle Sam, apple pie, apple pie, obesity, obesity. obesity. colonialism. Colonial. Yeah, both American sides of it. Dream. American dream. And manifest destiny. The, love. Part of the American dream. Okay, good. Um, what else? Freedom, democracy. I can't remember. Noticing a lot of values, a lot of symbols and values, on the American side, and a lot of like <coughs> charismatic megafauna and big historical things on the African side. So they're not, they're not even. I mean, they're not bad. They're, they're both correct answers, but um, they're not the same. We don't think of ourselves the same way we think about Africa. Um, so my last question to you, because we got to wrap up. I'm sorry. Uh, here's Miriam again. Let's say she's going to attend uh, an IDS lecture in Tanzania. And there's going to be a PowerPoint presentation teaching her about America, about you specifically. I'm going to show a picture of you in a PowerPoint to Miriam. She didn't agree to this, so I'll have to ask your permission. Uh, what do you want her to know about you? What do you want her to know about you? If you, were, if you had to tell her one thing, you know, hobbies, interests, where you're from, Montana. You're from Montana. Okay. What else? What about you? You don't want to know anything. You want to be a secret. I got one. I saw this picture because oftentimes when I'm overseas, people are amazed that I do dishes. Oh. So I want her to know that I do dishes just like she does dishes. Okay, you do dishes just like she does. We're yeah, we gotta do dishes. The Buddhist wasn't that the Buddhist teaching? Have you eaten your rice? Wash your bowls? Anyway, totally unrelated. Um, what do you want her to know about you? I know this is like a third grade question, but I honestly want to know. Something no one else. Oh, yeah. fair enough. <laughs> Irish jeans and yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you, yeah, a want, a need, a deep desire to not be burnt to a crisp. Okay. What about you? Something you like that people here probably don't know. Okay, so you'd want her to know that you have siblings and what it's like yeah. to have siblings. Okay, last one, you in the back. What do you want her to know about you? Okay. All right. Simple things, nothing, nothing complicated. Just things about you. Uh, things that I didn't tell you about her. 
I told you she lives in a mud hut and she's really poor. Um, I didn't tell you that she had HIV from birth and she's probably not alive right now. I could put this picture up and tell that story in front of any NGO and get a lot of money and go abroad to stop girls getting HIV or something. But I didn't tell you that one of her favorite things to do is to harvest wheat because it's a really common experience. I didn't tell you that her favorite subject was biology. I didn't tell you that uh, these are her two best friends who she's known since birth. And they go everywhere together. It's not the things we ask. It's not the things we think about when we see these pictures. We think about the story, the common story. So, oh, here's something. I, I used to ask her what she thought about America. You want to know what she said? It's a war zone. She thought it was dangerous. She heard about gun violence. Occupy Wall Street was happening while I was there. She heard about that. Just thought it was a war zone. So. Well, you know it's time, so I'm gonna call it. So thank you. Let's give you a round of applause. Peter, are you willing to take a few questions if we want to stay afterwards for a few minutes? Yeah, can I also show the video? Oh. Are you willing to stay for just a few more minutes? Okay. okay. If you need to leave, go ahead and leave. Um, I'll look at the lights. All right. Is this your video? Or? No, this is, this is a great video. If you didn't understand the premise of this presentation, this will illustrate it. I'm basically heading up the team that's getting Africans together in this time of need for Norway, you know, helping them out. A lot of people aren't aware of what's going on there right now. kind of just as bad as poverty, if you ask me. It's not nice. It puts smiles on people's faces. People don't ignore starving people, so why should we ignore cold people? Frostbite kills too. Africa, we need to make a difference in Norway. We need to collect our radiators, ship them over there, spread some warmth, spread some light, and spread some smiles. Say yes to radiate. <laughs>
Okay, I'll let you go then. Thanks for hanging out.